Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming to today's event on uh, Trustworthy and Responsible AI, um, put together by the Distributed and Pervasive Systems Group of the Institute of Computer Science, University of Taktu. I am Abdul Rashid Otto. Uh, Co-moderating with me tonight, uh, this evening is Rasinte. Uh, I'm Rasinte. So we are thrilled to have you join with us for these insightful explanations into the world of AI and its trustworthiness. So we have an amazing line of our speakers who has come from uh, different parts of Europe. So, yeah. yeah indeed. Yeah, before we actually open the floor for our speaker's presentation, um, I would like to ask uh, a brief question, Rasente. You said trustworthy AI. What exactly is trustworthy AI, and why is this aspect important? Yeah, actually, I asked this same question from our uh, AI friend, ChatGPT. So it says uh, trustworthiness in AI is like having a reliable friend. It means ensuring AI systems uh, consistently perform their intended functions, adhere to clear rules, and avoid making unfair or peculiar decisions. It is crucial because users must have confidence that AI system will not produce biased or harmful outcomes. So let me ask this question from you, Rashid. So when we talk about responsible AI, how does that uh, tie into the concept of trustworthiness? Mm, okay. Um, I think uh, responsible AI is just an extension of responsible computing. Uh, it's an aspect that emphasizes that um, the development, deployment, and application of AI technologies, most importantly, must be ethical and accountable. So it demands that when um, we are conceiving to design, deploy, develop, or use AI, they must follow some principles such as fairness, transparency, privacy, and the likes. However, with emphasis on societal implications and ethical implications, which are the risks. Yeah. You don't need to break a stress, Rasinte. We actually have a full line of experienced speakers who are actually experts in this field to help us dive into the intricacies of this topic that we have in front of us today. So without further ado, uh, I would like to let us know that this event is divided into two sections. Um, the first session will be, in the first session, we'll be listening to talks related to gauging and monitoring the influence capabilities of AI, exploring the robustness of ML model, and also understanding um, what trusting AI is, is from user's perspective. Afterwards, we have a short break, um, then again we'll reconvene uh, for the second section, which starts at 17.45. Uh, here we'll be listening to talks that are related to towards improving explainability, fairness and diversity, and at the same time, AI under attack in the context of 6G network. So, um, opening the floor, without further ado, I'm going to bring in our first presenter for the night and speaker for tonight. Our speaker is Associate Professor from this institute, institute Associate Professor Huber Flores, who is also a docent at the University of Helsinki. His research interests and work spans across mobile and pervasive computing, distributed systems, and mobile cloud computing. Huba will be talking about AI sensors and dashboard, gauging and monitoring the influence capabilities of AI. Huba, the floor is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Rasinte and Rashid. So hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here today so that I can uh, talk to you about this uh, topic. Um, so this uh, talk has been um, uh, put together from a research vision that we have been constructed while working on spatial. And uh, a little bit of disclaimer as well, uh, some of the slides contain ideas that come from the discussions that I had in Ubicon with some colleagues uh, last year in Cancun. So Ubicon is uh, our uh, flagship conference in ubiquitous and pervasive computing. And it was, uh, well, it was not surprising to see that colleagues, they were working on these kind of topics, but the surprising part was that some of the ideas were complementing each other. So, <clears throat> let's start by saying that, uh, well, uh, 
Artificial intelligence, machine and deep learning, they are in the mode of everyone these days, especially in the form of CHAP GPT. But then, uh, well, as you might know, there are more techniques, plenty of human and biology inspired techniques that can be used to produce artificial intelligence. So for instance, we can have as well uh, genetic algorithms. Now, why machine and deep learning, they are so popular? And uh, the, <clears throat> the main point here is that these techniques allow us to construct AI with the current advancements in technology that we have. So factors that have contributed to that has been that we have now optimized algorithms that they can learn just with a few data, they can be trained faster, and then they also can uh, run in constrained devices. Another thing is that we have better tools. So for instance, TensorFlow, now we have, uh, like with a few lines of code, we can put together a neural network. We have as well uh, frameworks like Feden and Flower that we can use for training robust AI models in a distributed manner. And uh, at the same time, there is uh, increased processing capabilities. So now with distributed systems, they, we have all the, the ecosystem of tools that allow us to put together all these massive clouds. So now we can perform huge computations in parallel. And this as well, interesting enough, was uh, pointed out by Geoffrey Hinton, which is the godfather of AI. So he was mentioning that in his interview that back on in the day when he started to train machine learning models, the performance was really poor. And this was because we didn't have that uh, uh, much uh, capabilities. So as we decided to continue uh, uh, training these algorithms massively with all of this computing power, then uh, we realized suddenly that we were uh, having these human-like interactions. So the applications were, uh, were showing human-like interactions. And this was uh, a little bit, uh, uh, well, developers and designers were feeling a little bit unsafe about it. So then uh, there was this uh, uh, open letter, uh, probably you remember, for uh, pausing giant AI experiments. And interesting uh, enough, this was almost one year ago. So we are at the time that this open letter was released. Uh, and uh, my concern was that, well, this new software, AI software, it cannot be verified with classical verification methods that make AI trustworthy. So then what does this uh, uh, making AI trustworthy means? To understand that, we need to talk a little bit about trustworthy computing. So trustworthy computing by itself is a domain that has existed long ago. Uh, and it started by, well, um, guaranteeing the errors and, uh, and uh, as well uh, drifts in software also can be quantified. And uh, suddenly got a lot of traction because Bill Gates sent his uh, famous memo to the internal company, you know, saying like, okay, now we have software, now the strategic movement for the next year will be to focus on building software that is trustworthy. What he meant was that there was expected software to be secure, reliable, available, private, and so on. Now, what happens is that, uh, well, AI, because now it's part of the tools of the software, of the applications that we use, it is expected to have also the same characteristics or how it's called now, trustworthy properties. So now we have, uh, well, uh, acts or their upcoming acts that uh, they are uh, drafting all of these properties that AI needs to have. And uh, because of the strategic importance of AI as a technology, there are more properties that actually, actually have been defined by economical and regulatory entities. So the main goal of these uh, regulations is that we can keep control on the, on the technology. And for instance, uh, we can foster uh, national, international sovereignty over these technologies so that anyone in the world, it doesn't matter whether they are, whether they're in China, you, or America, they can feel safe about using these technologies. Uh, <clears throat> but this is not the first time that uh, you know, humans have been experienced disruptive technologies throughout the history. We have, have all these emerging technologies. Uh, but we have managed to control it, and uh, we have controlled it through sensor-like mechanisms that allow us actually to measure, to quantify, and to tune it. Uh, so sensors are fundamental mechanisms for data collection and measurements. Humans like to measure a lot. There is, a, from history, there is a lot of different sensors that, that have been created. And the sensors actually allow us to quantify and to characterize properties, aspects, objects, and so on. And if we look at that trends over time, then we can actually tune it and ultimate, ultimately control it. 
To understand this further, let's look at some examples of disruptive technologies. So fire is one of those. So ancient times, you remember humans, uh, uh, well, they learned how to produce fire or to harness it. They saw the benefits, but it was after they monitored it, they tuned it, uh, they uh, were playing with it that the technology became controllable under us, and now we can use it at will in any things. I don't know if there was like a, a cavern main open letter to stop fire developments, but who knows, right? Uh, the other example is electricity. We also, uh, well, we were able to harness electricity uh, from natural events at first. So I guess all of you know this uh, Benjamin Franklin famous experiment where he was in a storm and then uh, there was a comet flying and he wanted to capture a thunder light. So that's some of the first times that we wanted to get electricity to, to control it. But uh, afterwards, time passed, we learned how to produce it, how to uh, tune it, how to generate it, how to store it in batteries. And now, of course, we have the infrastructure and stable current that we can just propagate everywhere in our society. Trains is another technology that as well, well, it, uh, it was very disruptive because back on the day, uh, well, humans, they were just, move, just walking, but then trains came and then suddenly everyone can move faster. Let's talk a little bit more about trains, how sensors were used to actually uh, tune trains because everyone likes trains, right? So this is uh, the first uh, prototype of a train that was uh, uh, created. So basically it was not with the purpose of being a train. Actually, the purpose was to have an engine uh, which was portable and it, that worked on steam. But then, uh, uh, yes, they, they wanted to have this uh, a portable engine because most of the, 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 the plants, the steam plants, they were just fixed, they were big, so they, they, they cannot carry them around. So then this came as, a, as an option for having this portable engine. But then they suddenly realized that this power actually can be used for moving the train itself and to drag stuff, payload, people. But we didn't go from this prototype to this uh, latest development in trains that we have. The technology has been gradually evolving. But it was not just a student jump. Actually, the evolution of train it's, uh, it has been for a long time. And how we use, or what kind of devices we use to actually understand trains. We use sensors. So what I'm showing you here in this picture is actually some of the artifacts that scientists back at the day, they were using to measure measuring all of these properties. So here you can see this, all of these artifacts were inside what, uh, what is called a dynamometer car. And this dynamometer car was just, just put you know, with the train and then scientists on board, they were collecting measurements and then they were understanding what was the pull force of the train, what materials they have to use, what type of payload they can drag and so on. So then finally, and after understanding all of these properties, they started to optimize uh, railways, train designs and so on. Now the question is, we have a technology that is mimicking human-like behavior, interactions. Could we use actually sensors to tune it, monitor it, and ultimately control it? Well, to understand this, we first we need to know where AI, how AI is built and uh, where it's located in applications. So what you are looking at here is, uh, in a nutshell, the standard machine learning pipeline, and uh, we use those to construct AI models. The pipelines are just a set of steps that allow us to take data and make this data uh, in a way that an algorithm takes it and learns from it. So these steps, for instance, are data ingestion, we collect some data, we prepare the data, we do some augmentation enrichment, we select an algorithm for, uh, that we want to use for training, then the algorithm learns, we deploy the, uh, the, the, the model, the, the one that is produced. And finally, the model is just interacting with users so that some recommendation or some personal guidance can be performed. Now, one interesting aspect of this is that here, uh, as, more, as uh, we get newer contributions from the data, then this is an iterative cycle that the model is train, uh, learning all the time. So then this is how we built uh, uh, AI models. Where these uh, pipelines are located, they are inside components, 
and these components are inside the applications. To understand that, let's go gradually. Uh, so then here you can see a client-server architecture, which is the most basic scheme. So then you can see um, <clears throat> here that we have the application, and then we have a database where we are storing the information that the application. So for instance, think in terms of online bookstore. If you have online bookstore, then you have components deployed in a server, and then there is functionality there, like for instance, searching book, uh, retrieving the, uh, book information from this specific type, and payment. And then all of these are actually storing information in the database. Uh, typically, all of these uh, components are distributed in different servers, but therefore, for simplicity of this talk, let's say that all of them are running in a single computer. As the clients interact with this application running here, we started to look that these interactions actually they were valuable for us. Valuables in terms of we can actually produce models that can be used for recommendation and personal guidance of users. So the architecture actually evolved. So now you see here that even we have more people, specialized people to construct these kind of architectures. So now the interactions are from users are stored in the database, and then this new component here, the machine learning component, takes the information from the interactions and train machine learning models so that the users now they can well get the recommendations from the model. Where is the machine learning model? It's right here, so as you can see, part of a larger system. Now with, uh, of course, uh, newer paradigms, this architecture has evolved and is constantly evolving. So for instance, now with distributed machine learning, we have not centralized models, but we have federated models. So in a federated learning, we have, for instance, the central model here, which is a global model, and then we get contributions from the clients here to uh, improve the global model so that this new model can then be sent to end clients and then users that can just use it. So this actually creates more robust models over time. And it's uh, also can be used in a privacy preserve manner. But for the purpose of the talk, let's stick with machine learning because that's enough. So we have the machine learning architecture. What kind of applications machine learning can support? Well, there are plenty of those. For instance, the self-driving cars, the drone delivery, and of course, the chatbots. Uh, but what about the existing applications? Well, the online bookshop that I just mentioned, they use recommendations for you know, recommending books to people. Another example is, is as well uh, Netflix. So for instance, when you go to watch a movie, then you see that there is a number there, movie score match. And then uh, uh, if you have a, sky, a higher number, then this, well, is recommended to you because it matches your characteristics. Um, what considerations are taken to actually estimate this uh, number? It's unknown. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that not knowing the number will, you know, have something catastrophic, catastrophic happening. Uh, but then imagine a self-driving car having a number about the performance and showing that to the user would be really valuable because we can then well, be, be uh, secure that the, uh, the, the car is performing well. Now, of course, uh, Netflix says that they are not using AI, but then again, they don't want to tell us how they are calculating the number, so then they are refusing. But then again, it's a bad, uh, if they are using AI, it's a bad practice because they are just, they are, there are a lot of implications with data management there. So, the idea of introducing or having AI sensors and dashboards is that we can abstract the complexity of calculating uh, trustworthiness in applications. Uh, so basically, we can abstract all of this, we can create uh, sensors from, from each of the properties that they are present, and the overall idea is that they are all the time monitoring and providing this information in a, in a dashboard. So for instance, imagine in, in terms of fairness, an AI sensor for fairness. This will be really valuable because then uh, it would be very uh, possible to look at what considerations were taken for making a recommendation. So for instance, in this case, you can see the factors like, uh, like education, socioeconomic status, age, and so on. And then we can envision AI sensors for different properties, like for instance, explainability, how well are the explanations provided by the system, resilience, how well the model uh, overcomes attacks, 
and robustness, for instance, how well the model faces different situations. Uh, but uh, where these sensors are instrumented, well, I show you the how to construct AI models, and we do it through pipelines. So basically, these pipelines, they have to be instrumented with AI sensors. So if we instrument the pipeline each of, each of the steps with sensors, then we can extrapolate all of this information and we can provide it to the users. But now the key challenge is which sensors or where or in which step each of the sensors has to be instrumented. So for instance, if I want to measure resilience, I could easily deploy a sensor here in model deployment, whereas if I am trying to uh, estimate fairness, I could do it in the data ingestion step or I could do it in model deployment. The only difference here would be the type of uh, implementation that I will do. So for instance, if I will do it in the data station uh, part, I could use, for instance, a statistical or uh, some uh, uh, imbalance metrics. But if I'm doing it in the model deployment, then I can uh, use some demographic parity or some op or equal opportunity metrics to calculate fairness. But then th this is, this is, uh, th this is the, the challenge to, to, to see where this uh, sensor is going to be instrumented. But all in all, once we have the instrumentation of the sensors, of course, then all of them the are retrieving information so that it can be used by humans and can, can be seen visualized by humans. Now, one important thing to mention is that depending on what type of application there is, that's the type of sensor that should be highlighted as the main in the application. Because for instance, if I'm uh, well watching a movie, maybe fairness might be something that I would like to see. But if I'm uh, driving or taking an autonomous car, then something that I would like to know is the performance, how well the autonomous car will do the parking, how well will be like driving, for instance, in the city or in countryside, and so on. Uh, now, the AI dashboards, the idea is not just showing what are the capabilities of the models, but as well to, in, in, to include the user in the process of tuning the model. Now, this is um, defined as a requirement in the, in the, uh, in the acts, in the AI acts. Uh, and then uh, this is a requirement that is called human oversight. And uh, well, it's, it's not as easy as, um, as just having humans understanding this because there is a lot of different challenges. One challenge is that trustworthiness is, you saw, is there is a lot of properties and it's uh, quite complicated to let users, well, understand this. So, we are envisioned that as part of the process, well, AI sensors, they have another uh, job, and this is that AI sensors can then negotiate between them a trust score for a particular application. So for instance, if from all the trustworthy properties we create sensors, they can then negotiate just like chatbots they do, and then a trust score can be established, and then this trust score can be just shown to users so that they can tune it. But this doesn't solve the issue because, uh, well, human oversight is kind of uh, dangerous and complicated because, you know, humans can open backdoors to models or they can just introduce biases. So a way to uh, just how to envision how human oversight can be done is uh, imagine the situation that instead of having individuals contributing with the feedback of the model, we will have actually groups that are appointed by uh, the regulatory entities so that, for instance, the end users contribute with feedback, but then just this group of specialized people implement the feedback um, that, uh, because they, they need to have a specific knowledge and then they, as well, they need to, there has to be a reason why they are appointed for tuning the models. But all in all, we can tell that trustworthiness is an ongoing process and it's an ongoing process that, well, involves different people, not just computer scientists, involves uh, a lot of uh, uh, data scientists, uh, developers, different stakeholders, and all of them, they have to come and discuss about how to define trustworthiness. AI sensors and dashboards can allow and provide the conceptual abstraction to uh, make these uh, things uh, simple to understand, and at the same time can provide the tools so that uh, uh, we can then uh, monitor and gauge the inference capabilities of AI. For instance, imagine that in the future, in the near future, we will have then uh, autonomous cars and well, they will be around and then they will be equipped with models, with sensors, and when you, we interact with them through 
the dashboard, we can actually see how good the car actually operates. Or for, or for instance, cameras, what kind of considerations they are taking when surveilling people in the streets or delivery drones, and so on. Uh, but how far are we from this vision, actually? Well, in Spatial, actually, we are building this kind of technology right now, and then we have some prototypes on how this actually can be implemented and how can be, um, how can be evaluated and tested in the wild. So, for instance, here you can see this demo of the current uh, spatial platform that we have. And then, uh, as well, outside we have a demo running. And then, um, yeah, uh, of course, this, uh, this, this platform is, is one of many paths that can be used or taken for understand and foster trustworthiness in AI technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful and fantastic presentation. Um, do we, any quick question? Okay, we can, we have time for one. So um, I was wondering uh, about trustworthiness because uh, I, I also work in this domain a little bit, not like you, but it seems to me that uh, every application has a different way to define it. So I, I would like to, for you to comment a little bit on this. Yes, definitely. There, there is, this is uh, uh, something that in practice is, uh, well, we see seeing all the time because we have different applications, the trustworthy properties are the same, uh, but then uh, there are some properties that, based on the type of application, they need to be highlighted. So, for instance, when I was explaining about these AI sensors, I was saying that uh, some sensors might be more important for specific applications. So, for instance, in the case of the recommender, it would be nice to have, you know, the sensors focus and fairness and all these kind of uh, uh, metrics, but if we are looking at uh, applications, autonomous technologies, we would like to know more about actually their performance, their robustness, and their resilience, because those are factors that are affecting them. So for instance, I, I wouldn't like to get information if I'm going to board a uh, self-driving car about fairness, because, well, that's secondary. But then, yes, this is something that uh, has, to be, uh, um, has to be considered when we are uh, instrumenting applications with trustworthiness uh, mechanisms. Thank you very much um, for that wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, just my own takeaway, which I've been able to gather, is more like sensors are actually very relevant in this age and time. Uh, their relevance cannot be undermined. Uh, they've been very useful in gathering data. and We can actually use them to uh, capture some specific aspect of trustworthy AI properties. And the dashboard themselves can actually help us to monitor and gather some insight about the behavior of AI, just to wrap everything up from my own, my own understanding of the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Robert. Up next um, is our second presentation. Um, our speaker, all the way from Berlin, Germany, is uh, Mitchell Burger. Mitchell Burger is a uh, is a researcher at Franco Hofer Focus. His research interest and work spans across smart city, AI, blockchain, IT security, and smart energy. Mitchell Burger will be talking about exploring the robustness and accountability of ML models operating on multivariate time series data. Uh, Mitchell Burger, the stage is yours. So thank you very much for the nice introduction, Rashid. And hello, everyone. So my name is Michel Berger. I'm working at a research institute named Fraunhofer Focus, which is uh, located in Berlin. And um, in the research group I'm working on, we're conducting research on how to integrate artificial intelligence in uh, critical infrastructures. And today I want to present the results of a few experiments we did 
to um, integrate machine learning models into emergency communication, system, emergency communication systems and analyze the resiliency and accountability of the embedded models. Uh, but before I present the experimental results, I quickly want to provide a quick motivation on why this effort is even necessary. So in the recent decades, machine learning developers were heavily focusing on improving and improving the just the performance of the machine learning models, no matter which side effect this had and how opaque these models became. But however, if you embed uh, such models into critical domains, you need to ensure that the model and the underlying systems uh, ensure safety, reliability, and that there is some ethical use of the AI. So that's why there was some conceptual drift towards trustworthy AI in recent years, in which other desired features became important. And these features, for example, are fairness, explainability, transparency, but also resiliency and overall accountability. And uh, in this context, in the spatial um, process, we had the standpoint that, okay, uh, the existing processes and pipelines on how machine learning models develop needs to be changed, and the trustworthiness aspect needs to be considered for, from the very first moment of the machine learning development process. And to conceptualize this, we defined a high-level process consisting of four steps. So in the first step, it's important that, okay, you sit together with the really important stakeholders of your presentation, uh, of, your, uh, of your application, and define the trustworthiness objectives that's really important for your specific application domain. Then, based on the defined objectives, you go and uh, try to find and select existing metrics or define new metrics that are able to somehow capture these trustworthiness aspects and allow you to measure them. And Afterward, you really need to touch your machine learning pipelines. Instead of just uh, optimizing your machine learning models towards improved uh, performance, you also need to find a way to optimize your models towards these defined machine learning metrics. And one important aspect is here that this process can't be fully automi automized because some trustworthy aspects like explainability can't be uh, fully um, automatically evaluated. So in this step, it's important that you also consider the most relevant stakeholders and take them in the loop when uh, evaluating and optimizing your machine learning models. And yeah, today I want to uh, sh uh, show a few experiments on how we uh, try to analyze the resiliency and accountability of two machine learning models, which we develop in context of a use case of uh, a critical infrastructure, uh, specifically an emergency communication system. So this is the high level, architecture of our emergency communication system. I think it's not important to really understand the architecture today, but the key takeaways is that we have some, it's not working. Uh, we have um, a caller side or participation side in which different IoT sensors are equipped that uh, measure different things. And then we want to employ machine learning models that automatically detect emergencies. In the case, an, um, Emergency is detected, we automatically initiate a voice over IP emergency call, connecting the patient to a public safety answering point, and then both can have a discussion, and if required, medical response can be uh, initiated. And uh, we precisely we um, did experiments for two emergencies. The first is a uh, fall detection, which is important for elderly people, and the second scenario we analyzed is how to identify heart attacks. And I want to begin with presenting our the first scenario, the fault detection scenario, in which we analyze the resiliency of this uh, defined model against data poisoning attacks. And to develop this model, we utilize a publicly available data set called uh, Unimap SHA data set. It's a multivariate time series data set consisting of triangular acceleration data on the Lower right side, you can see example data from this data set. And as you can see, it has uh, measurements, um, per, per time step measurements according to these three Cartesian axes, X, Y, Z. And uh, this data set has uh, roughly 2,000, uh, 12,000 samples in which um, activity of daily lives, like standing up, running, jumping, are described, but also concrete falls. Uh, falling, like falling back, back, backwards, falling rightward, and falling forward. 
And um, in our uh, investigations, we did perform experiments with five different machine learning models and tried to analyze their performance for uh, identifying faults in this data set, but also their resiliency against data poisoning attacks. And before I want to present the results, I quickly want to introduce what poisoning attacks are. So uh, poisoning attacks in context of machine learning are data modification attacks that happen during the uh, training stage of a machine learning model. So the idea here is that the machine learning developer gathers data from untrusted sources and the attacker is somehow able to mani manipulate at least a subset of, the, of this data. And so in the end, the uh, machine learning model is trained with some manipulated data and the attacker is able to de uh, decrease the performance of the machine learning model or even uh, can have a targeted or untargeted misclassification. And in a random label shipping attack, the manipulation performed by this attacker is just really taking a data sample and flipping the label, as the name suggests. And um, regarding defense strategies, so there are a few defense strategies existing already for uh, against data poisoning attacks and label flipping attacks, and we performed experiments with so-called label sanitation attacks. And uh, the aim of this attack is just to mitigate the effect of the label flipping attack, and the idea is actually pretty simple. So the underlying idea is that the, uh, the poison and flip data samples can be understood as out outliers in the data set. And the solution is then taking clustering algorithms, algorithms like the K-Nevis neighbor algorithm, identify clusters, and then just relabel neighbor data points with contradicting label. And the target then is that you have a clean data set and hopefully train a clean model. Um, here you can see the results of the data poisoning attack, the label shipping attack on the data distribution. And as you can see, with increased poisoning rate, the original data distribution get heavily screwed. And at a rate of, for example, 50% data flipping, uh, the data distribution is heavily different than the original data distribution. And as we can see here, these are the results for the label sanit uh, sanitization defense. And as you can see here, the, um, the defense seems to work, at least from a data distribution perspective, since the original distribution can be more or less maintained until a poisoning rate of 40 to 50%. And interestingly here is that we also uh, applied this um, here, this label sanitation for the case where the data wasn't even um, attacked, and we can see that it's more or less the same data distribution. So what, what about the impact on the model performance? Here you can see the results of the model accuracy for the five uh, machine learning models. We analyzed on the left, you can see the uh, accuracy performance with an increasing uh, poisoning rate, and on the right side you can see the um, effect on the label sanitation defense. And as you can see, all five models more or less are very sensitive against data poisoning attacks. And up to beginning from a rate of 10%, the models became not even useful for the application domain. Interestingly, only the uh, random forest seems to be more, much more robust against data poisoning attacks. And uh, it's able to withstand the poisoning rate of up to 30%. What you can also see on the right side is that the label sanitation defense seems to be highly effective and you can see that up to a rate of 30%, all models, uh, um, it, were, it were possible to uh, reverse the effect of the data processing attack and the models maintain the uh, original performance of, of, of the classification task. We also did other classification um, analyze other classification characteristics of these models, but due to time, I think I will just uh, skip this now. And um, yeah, so what, what, what are the takeaways for the fault detection scenario? So first of all, false, false detection models are sensitive to very naive data poisoning attacks. And if you use data from untrusted sources, please take a res reservation and exhaustively analyze it. Second, label sanitation seems to be a promising defense strategy against random label shipping attacks. And we also found that it seems to be suitable as a default defense strategy, when, strategy whenever you use data from untrusted sources. And we showed that it's pretty simple to perform simple experiments to analyze the uh, resiliency 
characteristic of your uh, machine learning models. So please also do this if you develop machine learning models and uh, incorporate the insights into your model selection process. So the second scenario I want to present is related to an, an eye detection use case where we want to develop machine learning models that are able to detect heart attacks. And uh, for this scenario, we wanted to analyze the accountability of the model. And to de develop such an eye detection model, we utilize the PTBXL data set, which consists of uh, 12 lead ECG waveform data. On the right side, you can see an example of this um, with the 12 channels or called lead in ECG, in ECG use case. And um, this data set roughly has, has data samples from 90,000 patients, and it's annotated by two cardiologists, and you have a label of whether this is normal behavior or whether the ECG has indications for a uh, heart attack. And uh, to analyze or enable the accountability or explainability of this model, we also employed post hoc explainable AI methods, which are able to provide generate local explanations on why there's indication of an MI in the given ECG data. And precisely, we perform experiments with um, LIP and SHAP. And um, here's the simple mo the, the model we came up with. I think it's not very important for today. So we came up with a convolutional neural network that takes the ECG as input, performs a one-dimensional convolution, and then outputs a prediction score on how probable is, it, is that there is indication for an MI in this data set. And you can see on the, on the right button the performance characteristic of this model, and which is pretty satisfactory for our model, our use case. But to achieve explainability, we uh, came up, we performed this experiments with XAI methods, and we came up with three concrete explanation approaches. So the first one, we call it base explanation, in which we take the XAI method and let, try to let them identify the relevant input features that provide indications for an MI. And uh, we then use this data and overlay it as a heat map to the original signal. And you can see here that we have really fine grained explanation showing the indication at the relevant uh, data features that the model are focusing on. Based on this, we also identified the relevant type, the, the, the time segments that are, are most relevant for the, towards the MI, MI classification, and also the most important channels and or leads um, that the model things are important for the MI classification. And uh, here you can see two example, generated examples for LRP versus SHAP. And as you can see, these examples look pretty similar, but are still a bit different. And the big question is now, okay, which XAI method is better, and which should we use for our specific use case? And to approach this question, at least quantitative, we performed um, quantitative evaluation methods, and precisely we used three concrete methods. So the first method is a truthfulness analysis, and here the idea is, uh, is pretty simple. So the idea is if the machine XAI method really identify the relevant data features. Then if we manipulate this data feature, data feature, the classification performance of the model should decrease. And to validate this assumption, we also just manipulated random data features. And here we wanted to observe that, okay, if we just use random features and not relevant features, the model observa observation needs to be more or less the same. Uh, in the second analysis, we perform the stability of a single XI method. And what we here do is um, we wanted to see if the XI methods what provided similar, for, for similar input data, whether it provides similar explanations. And to perform this analysis, you need to define a similarity measure in the input space, but also a similarity, a similarity measure, measure in the um, explanation space. And uh, the last analysis we performed is a consistency analysis. This analysis allows us to compare two XAI methods. And what we do here is we take an ECG, generate explanations for, for the two different methods, and then um, measure the difference between these two uh, methods. And, okay, somehow, 
the results are not shown here. At least it's just a bit wide. Okay. <laughs> then usually this, this should be a bar plot. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, in the two source analysis, indeed, we found that the boss methods should um, or are find, identifying the most relevant points because what you would usually see here is okay, the model prediction probability distribution, which is plotted here as a bar plot really decreased uh, compared to the original distribution. And what we found is that the sharp XAI methods performs slightly better. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for that this doesn't work here. Uh, then the results of the stability analysis. Um, as I told you, for the stability analysis, you need to have a similarity measure in the input space and a similarity measure in the explan explanation space. And for the sim for similarity measure in the input space, it's important that it's related to your specific application domain. And since we analyze ECG data, we need to find similar ECGs. Um, but it's not easy to, to identify similar ECGs for two different patients because it's a biological process with a lot of randomness in it. So that's why we um, did a, a, a trick and we take one ECG of one patient, separate it into overlapping windows, then generated explanations for, the, for these windows and just compared and analyzed the overlapping part of it. So that we, this allows us to uh, define similarity in the input space, but um, yeah, that's it. And for the similarity in the explanation space, we just use the Frobenius norm, which is more or less the Euclidean distance for high dimensional, dimensional space. And on the right side, you can see the, um, the results for LRP and Sharp. You can see the average, average explanation distances plotted. And as you can see, LRP, seem, LRP seems to be much more stable than Sharp since less um, values with less distances occurred. And the last analysis, the consistency analysis, which allows us to compare two different metrics, uh, XI methods. Um, here we took the lead importance, and the underlying question we wanted to analyze is, okay, how often do LRP and Sharp identify the same leads as most relevant? And here you can see the results for, for uh, one, two, and three most important leads. And as you can see, in most of, in some cases, they indeed try, uh, seem to identify the most, the same leads as most relevant, but in most of the cases, it, there seems to be some disagreement between these two methods. And we, we can even plot this across the, the channels, and as you can see here, for example, LRP uh, seems to heavily focus on lead three, whereas Sharp focuses more on uh, the leads V2 to V5. So the question is now, okay, what, what do we do with this quantitative analysis results? So we claim that, okay, although the quantitative evaluation technique allows us to assess the effectiveness of XAI explanations across different uh, dimensions, um, there, just the quantitative evaluation is not enough. So to, to really uh, achieve accountability and create good explanations, you also need to incorporate a qualitative evaluation. And uh, because users can provide feedback on how good the explanations are, what need, to do, what need to be improved, and then you can also uh, allow to define trade-offs between the two different, uh, the three different kinds of analyze performed. So, um, just as a summary of the overall presentation, so machine learning models are vulnerable against data poisoning attacks. So, in case you use data from untrusted sources, please be aware of it. Second, the quantitative evaluation um, of XI methods allows us to compare their reliability and mean meaningfulness, but qualitative evaluation um, should also be used to generate good explanations in the application domain. And please consider integrating trustworthiness aspect from the very first beginning.
when developing machine learning models. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, we have time for one or two questions. If there is any. No, we need the questions should also go uh, into. Let's run Rodion first. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask, uh, when you use this uh, method to evaluate truthfulness of the different methods, uh, how exactly did you perturb the input, uh, the features that you measured? Yes, so, so what we um, did, so for every test set, uh, de uh, sample in the test set, we applied the XI method, then identified the 10% most relevant points according to this XI method. And since we use um, a neural network, we really wanted to um, turn off the activation. So we set, we set the value to zero so that the input activation is more or less uh, dropped out for this specific feature. So we set the most 10% relevant features to zero. Um. And I also have a question. Maybe you can go back to the 13th slide, because that, that is, seemed to me very interesting. Thirteen? Thirteen, yes. Okay, long, okay. So uh, here I didn't quite get uh, what you are doing, because you say there is an attack on the data, but uh, it can happen that uh, the, the test set data comes from a different distribution. Imagine that, uh, well, you have your training distribution, and then in the test distribution, maybe people are older, therefore they fall more often uh, in all sides. So, I mean, it seems to me that I, I don't get this. Maybe you want to explain what, why you consider that an attack and not a, a clear, a good data, but coming from, from a different distribution. So, so when you develop your machine learning model, you should make sure that the training data has more or less the similar distribution to your test data. So if your test data is not re represent, or the training data is not representative, you should go and find different data. Um, and here, what we here, this is just the distribution of the training data. So, to evaluate the effectiveness of the data poisoning compared to the original performance, the test data is never untouched, uh, never touched in our experiments. So, this is just the distribution of the training data. So, yeah, that's okay. I, I misunderstood. Okay, I thought you you would take different test no, data no. from different parts. That's actually exactly the point here, you can see, okay, the, the data distribution is not representative anymore, the training distribution is not representative anymore for the general application, and so the performance declines. Mm -hmm. So, and the last thing, maybe you can explain as LRP what it is. We, we all know, at least myself, know what is SHAP, but I never worked with LRP, so how, how it, uh, it is used in, uh, in uh, um, explanation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, layer-wise relevance propagation is an exp uh, explainable I method um, for neural networks, and what it basically does is it's trying to use these uh, back similar to, to the idea similar to back propagation. So, you have the the activation at the end and the relevance, um, which is said the relevance, and then you calculate how these relevance from from the output nor nor neuron propagates back to the input neurons. And there's always then different share and you make sure that the relevance per layer is always the same. And then uh, this allows us to estimate the relevances of the input, feed, uh, input neurons, which is a direct measure of the input features. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's the most we can have for now. We have to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, up next um, is our third presentation for the evening. Um, our presenter is from Tallinn University.
She is an associate professor as well, Sonia Sosa. Sonia Sosa uh, is an associate professor at the uni uh, at Stirling Univers University. Uh, she specializes uh, in trust in technology, human computer interaction, and user experience. And our researchers were well, uh, in this domain as well. Uh, join me to welcome on stage um, Associate Professor Sonia Sosa as she presents a human computer interaction perspective on users' trust in AI. The stage is yours. So uh, I was I was saying that I need to 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 have a disclaimer here. I'm not from AI. I'm not expert in AI. My expertise is in human computer interaction and uh, user experience evaluation. So. My talk here, and thank you for the invitation, I do believe that I'm going to present the perspectives of users. So how they see this topic of trust and AI, and how can we address it? So the idea is, is, is very simple. So I, I'm going to start by, by presenting the challenge and the motivations of addressing this word trustworthy, trustworthy AI, and how this is connected with users. Then I'm going to, um, to provide some directions and some perspectives from my point of view. And I've been researching trust for a couple of years now, more than 10 years, just say, and user experience as well. And I'm going to present my perspective. And then I will continue by saying, how can we address this? How can we evaluate and understand users and understand if, in fact, we are providing trustworthy AI technologies for them, and if they can, can understand as trustworthy or not. And I will end up with some future views and, and some concerns that I have regarding this topic. So to start with, um, oh, uh, we have these uh, EU settings of ethical and trustworthy AI principles. And they, they, these principles are very high-level high principles. So they say that we need to ensure or obey the law, respect current uh, regulations and legislations. They also say that IT providers will need to be ethical and, and, uh, and, and act with ethical principles and values. And they also say that uh, IT providers need to ensure that the AI model needs to be robust from both perspectives, a technical and a social perspective. And, um, and this, this technical perspective, as, as Uber was, was mentioned, this has been researched in terms of trust for, for quite a while. Uh, so many years, so from a computer, a computer trust perspective. But from a social or, or a more user perspective, this is something that it's not been so addressed and it needs to, to be addressed and researched in more deeply. So this is one challenge. How can we understand how users trust technology? And if we understand this, how can this benefit the models that we are designing. So this parallel between developing models for users to use and benefit from them, and at the same time ensure that to the models that we develop are understood as trustworthy by the users, this needs to be hand in hand. Because if we develop models and we keep on developing models without understanding if, they, if they, under, they are understood as trustworthy, then we all don't know what we are doing and we are measuring yeah, and we are kind of uh, changing behaviors without realizing what we are changing. This is, this is the human computer interaction perspective. And that's why I, I assume that the European Union now is telling us that we need to see it from a human-centered perspective. But what this means, this word, human-centered perspective, so human-centered perspective uh, or human-computer interaction perspective or human factors perspective is the perspective of users. So we need to address this issue. And I, I'm assuming that this is, uh, this is an emphasis in the European Union because this has been something that is not 
very much, uh, that was not very much addressed. And I know the reasons, because as you mentioned, Nuber, um, technologies evolve, and we were in the beginning of AI, and not everyone was using it. So nowadays, AI has evolved enough that all, almost all end users use it, like Netflix. So we reach to a point where technology can influence societies, technology can, can change behaviors, can, technology can pose risks to society. So, in terms, uh, I, I forgot to add the, the reference here, I added more, uh, in, in a few more slides, but according to uh, the ESO norm for, uh, in terms of concepts for AI, they say that AI system is something that is, operates in an autonomous way. But this has happened many years ago, so it's, this is not new. So what is new is that they can generate outputs predictions, contents, recommendations that can affect users' decisions, our decisions. And this is something, what is new here is that they are not static, these decisions, they are dynamic. So depending on context, on the application, these decisions, these predict, uh, predictions may affect more one aspect of behaviors than others. And this is what creates this fear of AI, in my perspective. And again, from this, uh, this conceptualization, we see, they see a provider as a person. So any person or anybody that develops AI. So uh, or generates an AI model and places it in, into the market. So you all are <laughs> providers in, in this perspective. And then what they say is that we need to ensure that the AI system that we develop, we all develop, needs to be, uh, to be assessed or uh, uh, needs to be assessed in terms of performance. And this means the ability of the system to achieve the intended purpose. How can we assure in this dynamic structure that the intention purpose of use of AI is the real intentions that we designed it for? This is the tricky part because users can, are very creative and as we are using it more and more, we can be more creative and use it in a malevolent way. So this is the risks for security that we are talking about. Again, these fears emerge, and then emerge the need for more regulations on how we implement this. And what, what these regulations affect the AI providers in this case? They affect because uh, from now on, they are going to impose financial penal penalties. So it means that if you're not complying with the ethical guidelines for trustworthy AI, you might, you might, because uh, regulations uh, of privacy regulations already were implemented, you might be, be um, uh, or you might not be allowed to launch your product in the single market in the European Union, or you might have a financial penalty and change some things. The problem here, <clears throat> the problem is that um, an AI system has proven to be, uh, um, to, be uh, to have some undesired bias, has proven to be, they have potential to, uh, to be misleading, misuse, has, has proven that this is, can be used, for example, to influence voters, has, pro uh, has proven to create this information, deep fakes and other things. So what this acts, and these AI regulations and principles are trying to do is trying to, they are trying to minimize the risk of our AI that, uh, model that we want to send to the single market to uh, provide desires and intended, uh, uh, or, or to, to create unintended uh, behaviors or in the, in the intended purpose. So they, they want to de-risk the situation and potential risks that this AI can, can provide in users. 
And they say that this, this has somehow impact on the ethics and has some impact on individuals and how on our well-being, what this means. It, it means that it's very difficult for, for AI providers to ensure that when they launch the product in the single market, they, the, the, the AI model is going to behave as expected because uh, people might use in different ways in different contexts, in different situations. But it is uh, easy for people to develop these AI models in an ethical manner, so abiding, abiding the laws. It is, it, is, uh, it is possible to design these AI models uh, in, with the, the intentions to ensure the well-being of individuals. What can we do then to avoid this uh, risky situations, and how can we ensure that our models are trustworthy or are perceived by users as trustworthy? Um, we need to develop new mechanisms. The mechanisms that we currently have are not enough. We need to develop uh, mechanisms that can invoke safety in users, that users can understand that these models will devel develop and can be trustworthy. Uh, in the, so we can assure users that they, are, they, they, need to, they trust these models. How do we do this? Let's go to the concepts again. So the concept of safety is a component, a function. And this component of function, the idea is to avoid failure or malfunction or to avoid some potential danger to a personal. To, to someone or to a property. In terms of AI system, this safety function uh, has the, pro, uh, the purpose to protect devices, to protect the physical and the psychological well-being, to, to the function to be aware of the impact that these models can have in the environment, to be aware of the social impact and to be more inclusive, and to be aware on how users are using it and, avoid, and try to avoid and risk the situations of um, malevolent use. So some of the risks that we had and we see uh, in terms of uh, the use of AI, they, they can be classified as, uh, for example, data breach, privacy concerns, data misuse, Overtrust, distrust, cybersecurity, and so on. I, I will uh, I will highlight overtrust. I don't think we 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 talk so much on this overtrust, and this is very problematic in terms of risk. Let's take an example. Overtrust, in my opinion, and um, and and uh, I am looking at the time. In my opinion, is the the an important aspect. It's because of the overtrust that we ha now have the fear of AI. Because in the past, we trust too much on these AI models, and we, we, we didn't question the potential risks that they could bring in the future. And because we didn't question, when they start to fail, we blame the IT providers. This is overtrust. And another, another question of, uh, another problem of overtrusting increasing the trust of users in these AI models is the fact that they, users, should be responsible for their decisions. But, but because an AI model is there so easily to help them to make the decisions, they kind of chilled on those AI models and they say, this is not my problem. I follow just the advice of these decision-making machines and if they are wrong, I'm not responsible for it. And this behavior is one thing that IT providers cannot predict or, or can. I don't know. <laughs> Let's just say. Let's just see uh, and go further. So how to mitigate these risks? We need, from one perspective, to ensure users trust. But at the same time, we need to be aware that users should not trust too much. Because if they trust too much, then they, this affects their performance. So we need to leverage or calibrate 
their trust in such a way that those who trust to less, they will adopt these algorithms and they use it in, in, uh, in and th these algorithms will benefit them in decision making. But those who trust too much, they are aware of the potential um, uh, uh, risks of following the decision without question, without thinking about it. So, challenge. We need to ensure the quality of use of these algorithms. And how we do this? We need to address three main pillars. One is the technical futures, the other one is the social dimension, and the third one is the user's characteristics. And, and how we do this? Uh, well, it's complex, it's not easy. <laughs> um, that's why we are, we, it's, it implies an interdisciplinary approach and implies for us to understand the system, not as a, 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 a technical system, but a social technical system that is going to be applied in the social structure. And this social structure, structure influences the way the system will perform. So we need new visions, new approach. We need the human-computer interaction expertise from my perspective. We need to understand that trust is connected with the notion of risk, definitely. So this trust, uh, the AI, AI Act already connects these trust notions with risk. We need also to have a broader view in terms of uh, system design and system evaluation. We need to, to, uh, to have the view that we need to assess the qualities of the system, the attributes of the system, so we can enhance the, the system of trustworthiness. But at the same time, we need to understand that we need also to assess the user's perspective. So we understand if, in fact, the users are perceiving the system as trustworthy. So we need to have these two, two different perspectives. And what is missing here? We need to integrate more uh, users in, in, the part, in the design process. We, citizens' lack of participation. We, we rarely, when designing, we, we, we don't design with users. We don't ask. About, uh, about their feedback in the beginning of the process, in the concept phase. We don't ask so much, we should ask more. In the, in the prototype phase, we should ask again. And in the development phase, we should ask again, because we need to understand their perspective. Um, and what happens with the AI Act, in my opinion, is because we overlook this impact of end users in the, in the system development. So they are now, uh, we are now in a moment that it seems like some say it's the discourse of fear, others say it's the discourse of the benefits. But we are in the moment that we need to ensure that users trust these algorithms so they can benefit from them. And how we do this, we cannot do it without asking them how they feel. Possible solutions. So we need more skills. For start, the current uh, curriculum education needs to change. We need, and I'm saying because I know that engineers and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, computer science, the lack of this component of human-computer interaction or human factors. And because of that, they don't know how to talk with social scientists. And vice versa, social science don't know how to talk with computer science. And because we don't talk with each other, there is a problem that we cannot adopt an interdisciplinary approach because we say one thing and they say another thing. And then who, who is in the middle? I think human-computer interaction uh, specialists can provide this middle ground, but this is something that is lack on our current education. What else? Um, we need more fo uh, focus on trustworthy HCI approaches, new mechanisms that can, uh, can uh, contribute for us to understand what exactly the 
AI Act once and what it, they mean by these uh, ethical guidelines uh, for trustworthy AI principles. We need to create a more safe space where we feel safe uh, so people can uh, first, uh, uptake these AI services. Uh, we need new concepts, definitely. Uh, no, new concepts that invoke trust, that uh, looks at trust from a user's perspective, and that respect their principles. So, uh, how do we do this from a user-computer uh, interaction perspective? We need to address the multidisciplinary uh, theoretical lens on trust. So, as some, someone was mentioned, um, people tend, or researchers tend to define trust in different ways. And so we need to find a common way to define trust, because if we don't find a common way, then we cannot co compare results. We need more user experience evaluation methods and lenses so we can understand users and uh, include the feedback in the design process. And we need more studies on user trust. How do we do this? Uh, to meet users', users needs, we need this. We need basically understand the context, evaluate how this is used in context. We need to understand what are the trust requirements for that particular con context and then design the solution. That's what we need. So the trustworthy HCI rationale that uh, I'm trying to claim <laughs> aims to mitigate possible communication challenge. That's the idea. So we can leverage, some, some people cal call it calibrate, the user's trust and, and, for, f uh, and create more trustworthy and safe environments uh, um, in society. Well, trust from my understanding is a degree to which a user or a stakeholder has confidence that the product or a system will behave as intended. So what we know, we know that AI research so far in terms of user trust, most of the studies are focused on this past years, three or four, five years. Most are, are conducted in USA and Germany. So there is a bias in this research. And most of them are focused on robotics and e-commerce. Again, more study, we need more studies. That's why we need more studies. There is no consent on how defined trust. There is a multitude of understandings. And how this affects uh, cross applications uh, is important to understand and have a common understanding of the, the topic. Um, is, is will facilitate our development trust for the AI. So unclear notions, misconceptions, breach of trust, uh, complex nature, in, in, uh, interdisciplinary, this is what we have right now. Uh, just an example from a literature review that we did, we have this four definitions of trust and they are used depending on, on the research. But all of them talk about willingness, be vulnerable, control, attitude, uncertainty, belief. So how do we address the social considerations of trust? Um, we need to have this human computer trust perspective because this is what we do to balance between the computer science and the psychological or social, so, uh, social um, um, cognitive science and sociology part of the interdisciplinary approach. Uh, these are some findings that uh, we, we got from our studies. But the idea is that we need to address all the functional part, but the UX part. We need to address the machine-centered, the human-centered, and the value-centered in our approach. How we, we do measure trust right now? So first, we need to find a common definition of trust. And then there, there is lots of things and 
toolkits and metrics that can come from a normative perspective from the European Union. One of them is the Atalai, this heuristic uh, set of uh, guidelines on how to ensure that your AI is uh, trustworthy. And then there is the pragmatic approach that comes not from the uh, European Union, but from researchers. And what we can do in terms of pragmatic, we address today about explainable AI, but we didn't talk so much on the subjective perceptions, so how uh, users understand the, the system as trustworthy. And in this aspect, we know that there are three main qualities from a user perspectives on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, human computer trust. They need to perceive the risk, they need to perceive that the system is competent, and they need to understand how benevolent is the system. These are the three main key characteristics of a, when users look at the system and assess it in terms of uh, trustworthiness. There is this uh, objective approach as well. Oh, uh, not this one, sorry. The objective of uh, the uh, evidence, so we also try to assess trust using physiological metrics. Sensors can be one of them. The most reliable way is using EEG. There is some studies that uh, also do, do it through voice and uh, eye tracker, but it's not so reli reliable. Um, so there are some guidelines as well in terms of uh, how to address the human-centered aspect. So this Schneiderman trustworthiness assessment process, the Z inspection method, CAP AI, human-centered trust framework, the, the, the list of trustworthy artificial intelligence atelier that I mentioned. And this is our research lab. So this is where we focus. We focus on the human-centric approach. And uh, what we can offer is just this lens that I just presented. We also have some knowledge on this, if you are interested. We have some tools and equipments and just a word of advice. It takes years to build and seconds to break and forever to repair trust. So this is not so, so light as we might think. And this is our team. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sonia, um, for the wonderful presentation about uh, trust for the AI from human perspective. We are really <laughs> right on time. <laughs> was, right on time, so we was, can't really take any question. Uh, but thank you very much. That was really a wonderful presentation. I really actually learned a lot from your perspective how you use it, trust. Um, so uh, we'll be having a short coffee break, and then we reconvene again in 10, 15 minutes for uh, the second section of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello everyone, sorry about the delay. So, I hope you enjoyed the diverse uh, perspectives delivered by our esteemed speakers. So now let's, uh, let us move on to the next session. Uh, now we are delighted to introduce our next speaker, Man Gwen, a distinguished research engineer at Montimage, who came all the way from uh, France to be uh, here with us. Uh, Man's extensive research ex uh, revolves around the fascinating intersection of explainable AI and automated vulnerability detection with a particular focus on gray box fuzzing. Let's warmly welcome Man. Thank you for the nice introduction. Hi everyone, I'm Mike. I'm research engineer at Multimask. So actually, this is the first time I have visited the beautiful country, Estonia. So I'm very happy to be here to present our talk so what improving explainability, resilience, and performance of cybersecurity analysis of 5G and IoT network? So this joint work with my colleagues uh, Ving, Anna, and Egado. So a bit about Multimask. So Multimask is a SME created in 2004 in Paris, France. So actually, we have contributed to many cybersecurity projects, uh, focusing on three main topics cybersecurity and defense, uh, monitoring 4G, 5G, IoTs, and recently 6G network, and also applies artificial intelligence in our solution. 
uh, we have developed an uh, open source tool for different security purposes, for example, to prevent and detect the cyber threat in different environments. And we also offer the cyber threat intelligence, penetration testing, and red team services. So for more information, please visit our website. So actually, you might already know about the spatial project. So right now, when we talk about just what the AI is, it's not just about achieving high accuracy of the model, but at the same time, we need to take into account other characteristics such as just what the transparent and expandable. So Multimars in the spatial project, so we contribute to one of four practical use cases, focusing on the cybersecurity analysis of 4G, 5G, and IoT network. So let's jump into the outlines of my presentation. So I will start with an overview of our AI-based security application, and then I briefly discuss the state of the art of uh, experimental AIs or XAIs and adversarial attack. <coughs> and then I will introduce to you our Multimars AI platform or MAIF. And then uh, I present the performance evaluation and how we apply XAI for resiliency in our use case for anomaly detection. And finally, I will conclude my talk and discuss some future work. <coughs> So encryption is changing the attack landscape. So according to the survey of Zscaler, as of 2022, 95% of uh, owned internet traffic is encrypted, and over 85% of uh, attack occur within the encrypted traffic. So we can say that encryption uh, protects the user privacy, but at the same time, it also increases the complexity of security too for network traffic analysis and classification. Uh, furthermore, we are seeing a massive increase in uh, data from uh, IOTs and mobile devices. So with so much data and also uh, new threats coming day by day, so we need uh, advanced machine learning techniques actually to uh, detect the hidden anomalies and efficiently process the flooded data. So in Multimask, we have uh, developed three AI-based security applications that correspond to three um, main steps of intuition, detection, and response. So the first application is a traffic classification. So we identify certain type of normal user activities, such as web browsing, chatting, or video streaming. Uh, the second application is to detect the common cyber attack in different environments. The last one is to root cause analysis that we discover the root cause of an incident and then we propose a mitigation action. Uh, in the next few slides, we will discuss more about the application for anomaly detection. So before that, uh, let me quickly uh, introduce the state of the art of the experimental AI and why it's important. So actually, advanced must advanced machine learning techniques like deep neural network with uh, so many layers and parameters are considered as a black box and users just don't understand why uh, this model returns this kind of prediction. So in this case, XAI refers to method and technique that provide insight into uh, how AI model make decisions. So it allows users to trust and uh, effectively manage AI outcomes. So, so in this figure, we can see uh, XAI can be categorized in different, uh, 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 different class. So XAI can provide the uh, expression of uh, a particular features or all the features of the models. So it can be model specific or model agnostic uh, regarding the format. So the expression can be in form of acumen model text or using the visualization technique like charts or plot. Uh, XAI method can provide intrinsic expression or some uh, popular ones can provide the post hoc insight. So in our case, we focus on providing uh, post hoc local global expression in terms of charts or plot using some popular model agnostic XAI method. 
Uh, also, uh, <coughs> advanced machine learning techniques uh, are vulnerable against the uh, adversarial attack. So in this case, uh, attacker aim at uh, manipulating input data to deceive the AI model to degrade the model accuracy and often resulting in incorrect prediction or uh, classification. So on the top right, uh, very famous uh, uh, example. So by adding some noise to the image of a panda, so the model misclassifies as a given with 99% confidence. We can also classify the adversarial attack in four main categories. So why the transfer-based attack relies on the information about the training data, uh, as the three attacks just uh, need information about the model itself. <coughs> we can also uh, evaluate the adversarial attack in two different settings. So untargeted setting in which attacker can flip the label to any label, and targeted setting in which the attacker flips the label to a specific, specific target class. So in this case, we will explore the relationship between the XAI adversarial attack and how it impacts the model uh, performance. So on one hand, XAI can be used to produce the inside of the models, and it can also be used to prevent or detect uh, adversarial attack to use a list of important uh, features of the models. And on the other hand, um, XAI methods are vulnerable against uh, the adversarial attack. So in this case, attacker can also apply the XAI to gain more insights about the model and then to effectively generate the input to degrade the accuracy of the model and also to trick the XAI method to produce uh, innocuous or incorrect explanation. So in this case, we need to consider the trade-off between uh, explainability, resilience, and model performance. So it's not an easy task, but uh, one potential solution is to actually to define a uh, quantifiable metric of the explainability and resilience and let the user to evaluate them and consider the, the, most, the best one for their concrete use case. Uh, so now I will introduce to you the, our multi mass AI platform, or MAIF. So actually, uh, we want to put everything together in one place. And this one is the open source tool offering user an intuitive use user interface to interact with our uh, AI services. We also apply the XI method to provide the explanation of our models. Uh, we allow the user to uh, perform the evaluate the accountability metric. And also we can see on the table uh, the main difference between our platform and existing explainable platform is that we allow the user to perform the adversarial same uh, attack and also evaluate the robustness of the model on our platform. So this lies so an architecture of the, our platform. So it consists of uh, server side and client side. <coughs> so on the server side, we follow the AI pipeline. So we collect the raw network traffic data from uh, network IOTs, 4G, 5G testbed, and also from the attack database using the cyber threat uh, intelligence service. Uh, then we uh, attract the feature of the, of the traffic, and then the malicious traffic detector modules will uh, predict whether the network traffic is benign or malicious. We also add uh, some other modules like uh, XAI's adversarial attack to uh, offer user various uh, services. So actually, the server is written in Node.js and it uses our monitoring tool MT Probe for the feature extraction, and it leverages uh, some popular Python libraries for uh, XAI's and deep learning. The client size uh, is between React, so it offers user a uh, way to 
interact with uh, our uh, AI services through dashboard. So this one is open source, so you can check out uh, the code and also the video demo on the GitHub. So now let, let, let uh, talk, uh, talk about uh, concrete use case for anomaly detection. So it's true that uh, IoT device and mobile device are vulnerable against uh, uh, cyber attack like botnets, ransomware, or DDoS. So in this case, we develop uh, our modules uh, by combine, combining uh, the two uh, uh, techniques, uh, stack auto-encoders and also convolutional neural network. <coughs> so you can see on the right the uh, architecture of our models. So uh, we have two separate uh, auto-encoders, one for processing the normal traffic and another another one for processing the malicious traffic, and the outputs of the two uh, encoders will be concatenated in one vector that will be the input of uh, one-dimensional CNN. And it will return the one of two labels, malicious or benign. So this slide also shows some flow-based features that we extract from the neural network traffic for example, total number of IP packets, total length of IP header or payload, flow duration, and so on. <laughs> so actually, we, for the uh, performance evaluation, so we use a public data set, CSE, that includes the seven attack scenario for trending, and also we test uh, our model using our private data set so we see on the table, so we got 99% uh, of accuracy for botnet detection, 97% uh, for the infiltration uh, detection, and also uh, on the network traffic in the user activity data set uh, are classified as be nice using our model. So actually, I just present uh, our um, deep learning uh, model for uh, anomaly detection. So in this case, we want to understand why our model achieve uh, high accuracy. So you can see that uh, this slide show three summary plot uh, showing top 10 most important features uh, <coughs> using the SAP uh, analysis. So in uh, three uh, cases, uh, the flow duration is the most important feature of our model. So actually, the flow duration is also the one of the most applied uh, characteristic uh, for botnet detection in literature. Another important feature is to is uh, number of packet with a specific flag, like reset finish. So in this case, uh, some botnets try to to prevent the detection, so it uh, wants to uh, establish a new connection. So you can see that uh, our model prison have priority with uh, domain knowledge. So now let's, let's talk about uh, how we up apply XAI for resiliency. So in this case, we consider uh, a, a scenario of the black box attacker so attacker can perform three poisoning attack at varying poisoning rate at 0%, which is the baseline, 10%, 20%, and so on. Uh, here we, up, uh, we perform three poisoning attack, like random swapping label, target label flipping, and also we uh, generate and add the new data that looks similar to the real one using the GAN technique. And then we retain the models uh, using the poisoning training data set, and we evaluate and compare it with the baseline using the performance metric and also the accuracy decrease metric. So uh, it's not surprise that uh, when we increase the poisoning rate, the accuracy of the model will be decreased. However, for our models, is to achieve pretty good accuracy. Uh, for example, 95% for infiltration detection, even under high volume of 
40% for origin data. Yeah, this one. And also, when we uh, increase the positioning rate to 50% or, or more, so actually the model becomes useless. So more and more testing samples are classified and malicious. And also among the three attacks, so our model is more vulnerable against uh, the two attacks, random swapping and targeted flipping, uh, than against the gun-based uh, poisoning attack. <coughs> so in this slide, we will explore uh, how we can uh, apply SAI uh, to detect the existence of the, uh, adversarial attack. So you can see it's, uh, this slide shows two uh, summary plot showing top uh, 20 uh, most important feature before and after the attack. So on the right, you can see that uh, so now the flow duration is no longer the most important feature of our model. And also, we don't see any feature related to the number of TCP packets uh, with specific flag. So in this case, we can conclude that uh, one potential solution is that we can use SAI to actually to detect whether there is some changes in the training data set or also in the model itself. Yeah, to, to conclude my presentation, so actually we designed and developed the uh, multi-mass AI platform uh, for the network traffic analysis and classification so it allows users to uh, build the model, to compare the model uh, with different configuration, to apply SAI to obtain the explanation, um, perform different uh, adversarial attack, and evaluate uh, uh, some metric. Uh, so we integrated our tool into the uh, spatial framework, and currently we are testing it uh, with different stakeholders. Uh, some future work, maybe it's, uh, we will inject more complex uh, evasion attack and also to apply the, some defense strategy uh, against the evasion or data poisoning attack and also to continue to evaluate uh, our tool uh, using the real data set. So thank you for all listening. <coughs> thank you, Mon, for that uh, enlightening presentation. So we have enough time uh, only for one question. So is there any question? I hope not. Thank you. Thank you, Mon. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, David Solans from thank Telefonica you. Research, who came uh, from Spain to share his expertise with us. His work aims to address social risks and utilize, utilize technology for social benefits. Uh, please join me in welcome David Sonos. So hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to stay to be here my first time in, in Tartu. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, in this amazing building uh, giving my talk that is called fairness and diversity in the specific case of federated learning. First of all, I would like to know if there is anyone here in the room working with uh, federated learning specifically, distributed learning in general, is anyone working in this respect? Beyond Uber, anyone else? Okay, maybe after this talk <laughs> you will be interested in, in working in this domain. So, first of all, who am I? I'm uh, David Solans, a research scientist working in Telefonica Research. I hold a PhD in the topic called algorithmic fairness that we have been uh, discussing several times during this uh, seminar. Uh, basically, when, what I'm working on is on non-discrimination in, in AI, right? And then, my, in general, my research interest uh, is dedicated to the use of technology to mitigate issues of social significance, but also at reducing those risks that are arising from the use of technology in our daily lives. So uh, this is a bit the table of contents. I will cover a bit what federated learning is. Uh, then I will explain about algorithmic fairness and uh, finally data diversity in this specific context 
of federated learning. But I would like to start by um, recalling that uh, we are all living in a world in which data is distributed among devices, right? So there is data that is in our mobile phones, there is data that is in our wearables, there is data in computers, there is data in servers, there is data in sensors, there is data everywhere, right? So, uh, okay. So in this uh, distributed data paradigm that we are all living in, this, the classic approach to train AI models is uh, this approach that we have here, right? So um, we have data, uh, okay? Uh, different users in, with, with different devices having uh, their local data, and the classic approach is to upload this data to a global uh, server, can be a, I don't know, an insulated server, can be a data center, that aggregates all this data received from the individual devices, uh, aggregates that in a, in a database and trains the so-called global model, right? That's the classic approach, but it has some, um, some, yeah, the pro is that it typically has high accuracy because you have a complete picture of the world, but as one of the cons is that operators have access to potentially sensitive data, right? So people are sending their data, this data can contain sensitive information, and in this way we are aggregating potentially sensitive data. The alternative is federated learning, right? So this time in federated learning, the first step is to download a given model from the server, right? So uh, every single client device downloads the model from the global server, they're trying their local uh, uh, copy of this model with their available data in the local device. So typically we, we say that they train their local models, then they send these models back to the server that aggregates aggregates all, all of them, for example, by, by averaging and creating a global model, right? And then um, this process can be iterated, so this global model can be, again, sent to, the, to each of the devices, and they will retrain this in a cycle until the convergence criteria is met, right? What is the main pro here? So it's privacy preservation, right? So we are not sharing data with the the third party, the service provider, or whoever, because the data, the training data is kept local to the devices. Also, it's scalable because we don't need a data center to build our models. We just need an aggregator that uh, does the median about uh, across all the model parameters. And um, yeah, it has the ability of building customized local models because in the last stage, when the glo global model is, pre is ready already, you can still send that to the uh, end users so that they will run an additional uh, round of training and this model will become extremely personalized to them, to their local data. Okay, so that's the context we are working on. And some examples on where, uh, where is federated learning used. One of examples, uh, one of the most well, uh, well-known examples, is the Google Keyboard. I don't know if you knew that, but Google use, is using federated learning to uh, train the uh, next word prediction model that they are using. Right. So when you are typing, you see you get this recommendation saying, "Hey, are you writing this word? This is based on federated learning." So they access the data stored in each local device. They create the model, they exchange it to that to the, with the global model, with the global server, and uh, they are building this approach to uh, yeah, increase the, the accuracy, the prediction accuracy by 24%, for example. Another famous use case is the, uh, yeah, the hospital thing, right? So imagine uh, the use case in which several hospitals want to work collaboratively to build a diagnosis model, right? Based on, for example, images. But there are some legislative uh, restrictions, constraints that are preventing, that is preventing them to share from sharing their data. So the alternative here is the so-called cross silo in the sense, uh, so there is the cross device, let's say in that the data is in devices. Cross silo <coughs> um, is the setting in which data is distributed among different organizations. And there is plenty of papers also, um, academic work, but also industrial work uh, done in this setting. So, in Telefonica, uh, we have this research-oriented um, research working prototype that we call FLAS, which is Federated Learning as a Service. Here you have a screenshot of how it looks in, in a mobile device. And if you scan this QR code, you can access the GitHub repository. So this is Federated Learning ready to be deployed on, on mobile devices. Right? 
Uh, we also have uh, several papers, demos, and a patent uh, right uh, on, on Flash. And this is something we are also, so Flash has been developed and uh, is being extended in the spatial project. So how Flash is organized, this is the architecture of Flash. It offers four main modules. The first one is the administrator interface. Uh, that is this uh, part. This offers a front end for the administrator to set up federated learning processes. Then we have the Flash server, which is the inherent orchestrator of uh, the overall process. The notification service that is not plot here, but it appears there, uh, which is the channel that uh, allows the server interact with the client and the client with the server, and then the client devices that are the ones that are installing the app. I was showing you at the very beginning. Okay, now we know about federated learning, hopefully more than before, and now I'm going to talk about algorithmic fairness. So, okay, so uh, from a very general point of view, I'm not entering into the details of algorithmic fairness, but the idea is that we are training models, AI models, that at the end have been trained on data, right? Uh, once trained, models are often used to make decisions which can help uh, or affect or influence as Sonia was saying, human beings somehow, right? So this might, um, these predictions might play a role, an effect on top of human beings. And then also something we know is that these decisions can be biased against certain demographic groups based on protected attributes. For example, these decisions can be uh, treating differently people of different genders, ages, races, and so on. Then a nice example that I always uh, like to, to present is uh, the gender shades. Um, so this project is from MIT. There was a researcher interacting with uh, several commercial AI-based products for gender classification uh, given a face, right? You upload an image of a face and it says to you, it's a male, it's a female, right? What they found is that when analyzing um, commercial products, so you, you split your data between males and females, they created this quite big data set, and when analyzing uh, the difference of accuracy between males and females, some of the products, in particular the Face++, Plus Plus, I think it's a Chinese brand, uh, was yielding up to a 20% difference in the accuracy, right? So the system was, uh, the accuracy of the system for males was up to 20% uh, higher, right? Then you can do the same if you have this information available, of course, with the race. And you see that in this case, IBM was working up to 19% better for light skin than for dark skin individuals in the same data set. What happens here is that when you combine race plus, um, plus gender, you have these gaps, right? So the first column is dark skin males, dark skin females, light skin, skin males, and light skin uh, females, and the gap is increased up up to 34%, okay? So what we are saying here is that uh, we need to be conscious about these problems. This is something that happens in, in practice. Then talking about countermeasures, then there is, uh, you can always collect more data, more diverse data, but typically collecting more data is something that is not as, as easy as going to the supermarket and buying data, right? So typically the, the three um, types of, of strategies that are uh, applied here is pre-processing, so somehow you try, you try to rebalance your data before training, in-processing, so you try to uh, modify your learning al algorithm when training, for example, you add a regularization term, or you apply post-processing, which is about uh, modifying uh, the predictions of the model so that they are remapped, okay? Then, uh, how is algorithmic fairness applied in federated learning? This is a bit more complex, right? So we were talking before about group fairness in, in centralized AI, but here we, are, we have different perspectives of, uh, of what fairness can be, right? So remember that every round we are selecting a set of users to participate in the, in the federated learning process. So how you select and, and balance the selection of the users is a fairness perspective, right? So client selection. Group fairness is the same approach we were discussing before. So you w might want a model that works equally well among, among demographic groups. Accuracy parity here will mean that you want a model that yields similar accuracy across the different clients, but there are also there are many others um, 
perspective on fairness, and I'll be happy to discuss that with a coffee, maybe. So, uh, you see the thing is getting a bit complex, right? So it's getting more and more complex when you start um, thinking about what fairness uh, characteristics can be uh, assessed in the federated learning domain. Uh, but if we go to the fundamental source of these biases, typically we are talking about data, right? So data is the main source of bias in general. Uh, there is the notion of representativity. There is also the common case of uh, data being unbalanced, right? And typically we are discussing that at the granularity of demographic groups. This is in the centralized setting typically and also one of the specific cases of federated learning. So with this in mind, with this idea of data is the main source of biases, let's, let's go to the next section, which is data diversity in federated learning. So data diversity in federated learning, typically in the state of the art has been approached as we see in the screen. So researchers put IID data sets, for example, for the label, they split um, labels equally, so all the devices have the same distribution of labels, for example, and then they create a non-ID scenario in which uh, they distribute labels so that um, a portion of the labels are stored in a group of devices and, and this joint group of uh, labels is stored in a different set of devices. What happens here is that uh, in the IDD setting, if you see this, this plot, but uh, in general, without entering into the details, is that in the IID setting, the local optima of the clients uh, is aligned with the global optima of uh, the overall model, but it's not the case when you consider the non-ID setting, right? Or more than it's not the case, can, not, can be not the case in this setting, right? Because the, 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 the local data distributions might differ a bit from the global uh, data distribution. And this is something we were discussing before with the test train uh, alignment, but it can, it can happen uh, um, also between the clients, right? So clients might have very diverse data di distributions. Okay, uh, but what is the problem here? So there is a extreme <laughs> lack of federated data sets available for research. And of course, we, don't, we want to do research. So what's the solution here? And the solution is that people, researchers, typically do simulation, right? So we start from a centralized data set, a CSV, a whatever, and we partition that uh, trying to simulate the IID setting, but also the non-IID setting I was uh, mentioning before. So uh, what are the strategies that are typically used to create non-IID partitions? So typically there's the label SQ, as I was mentioning, like, um, distributing labels in a non-IAD manner, in an unbalanced manner, the attribute skew that is the same but apply to the attributes. For example, you can distribute more females in one group of devices and more males in the other, or quantity skew that is that uh, you will simulate clients having different size of, sizes of data. Very good. So. The problem here is that at least 90% 90, 90 and this is not uh, an empirical or tested uh, uh, number, this is something approximated, but around 90% of the research is using label skew sampling from a Dirichlet distribution. So most of the research when talking about heterogeneity in federated learning uses label skew and they overlook attribute skew, quantity skew, and I can tell you there are other perspectives that can be um, used here, right? when trying to simulate real uh, non-IAD conditions that you might find into, in the wild. So uh, there are tools, like uh, this tool created by people from University of Sapienza, which is called FedArtML, that is trying to somehow standardize the way of creating uh, the different techniques that you can use to create non-IADness uh, for federated learning research. Uh, then uh, from a broad point, uh, picture, from a broad point of view, what we know is that in general, accuracy tends to get lower when you increase the level of, of non-IIDness. So the more heterogeneous the data is, and this picture is just an example. Um, so the more heterogeneous the data is, the more problems you have to convert uh, with a model that is high accurate, highly accurate. And the same with fairness, right? So remember we were talking about fairness before, so what f happens is that with more heterogeneity, you have uh, more unfairness, and with less heterogeneity, typically you have less unfairness. But there is also another point of view here, and another trade-off, as we were discussing before. Uh, there is also the trade-off between accuracy and fairness, right? 
So there are like different um, components into this picture. We have heterogeneity, we have fairness, we have accuracy, we might also have uh, robustness and all these perspectives. And the, uh, the, the point of this talk is about explaining the, the problem we have, um, the need of uh, research in federated learning in general to perform the evaluation of all the algorithms we are testing under more diverse non iat conditions. So first of all, that's not the case. And then we don't know how well our algorithms will behave if, if we, we are not testing them under more diverse, uh, under more diverse conditions. So that's all about my talk. And here there are some summary about the, what I said uh, during the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for that insightful explanation. Uh, so do we have any questions? Yeah, so I have a question about, isn't the whole topic kind of contradicting itself? Because uh, if you want to use feathered learning and you want to eventually mix those models up, you need some information from the subjects so you can successfully do that. But algorithmic fairness and like, how does it work in the end? <laughs> That's a very good question. And indeed, it was something that I was hiding uh, in, the, in the presentation. So. Uh, so when you, are trying, when you are trying to build a model using federated learning, you are trying to restrict the amount of data you want to share with the, uh, the server somehow. And then uh, it's well studied that to achieve group fairness, we, you need at least to share the demographic statistics with the server, which is what you are highlighting here, right? So that's totally true, and that's why um, first demography, uh, so, sorry, uh, group fairness is just one of the items that is being considered here. But typically, the solution that we do in research, or of course, in practice, is to apply differential privacy when, when sharing the demographics. So you need to share them, but at least you hide. You, try, you can try to hide them. A bit, I mean, add some noise so that the, a malicious server cannot understand very well what are the, the distributions. But yeah, that's one of the problems of using fairness, uh, trying to apply fairness in this context. Thank you for the question. Any other question? Sorry. Uh, you showed when you use this uh, IID dataset and non IID dataset that the model uh, diverges. Uh, I wanted to ask on what scale does it diverge and how does it affect the accuracy of the model? Sorry, can you clarify what's the, the, the scale of what? You showed this chart yeah. where yeah, this. there are outputs. I just wanted to ask uh, what was this? Yes. The vertical yes. scale, uh, or is it just illustrative? Yeah, it's more, more or less illustrative, but I can give you more details on this. So the, uh, you need to think that, um, so yeah, different clients share their models, meaning that they are sharing their model parameters at the end, right? And then there is an aggregator that is uh, doing the average, in general, in broad terms. There are other strategies, but one of the strategies is federated average, so that they are doing the average of all the parameters, right? So for each of the weights, they average the received ones, right? So uh, you, you can understand that when you have more diversity, so models are more diverse, no, less heterogeneous between them, the client updates are more heterogeneous, there is more noise in the aggregation so that the convergence is lower. So the convergence quality, if you want to call it like that, is lower. The, Overall effect you get is that in terms of utility, and utility can be accuracy, F1 score, or any other metric that you are considering, you will have more noisy results because you are not converging equally fast or equally well, right? And then if you go to the next round, uh, when you analyze the quality, remember that there is this cycle, right? So the next round, you will share this model that is more noisy than the previous one. You are retraining that, and you are somehow, you keep uh, aumenting, exacerbating, this difference, this nice behavior, nice behavior. You're welcome. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, David. Uh, to summarize David's talk, at the moment there is no agreement or standard methodology to simulate data diversity, data diversity in federated learning. And existing algorithms are not suited to deal with the levels of data diversity. Quantifying fairness in federated learning settings needs further complexity than what's needed in the centralized settings. Uh, now our next speaker is uh, Bart Sinaski from University College Dublin. Uh, he specializes in IoT networks focusing on sensor-driven design, data collection, storage, and analysis. Please uh, welcome Bart from UCD. Thank you.
<clears throat> Just test them. Yeah, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, thank you to UT uh, team for putting all of this together. The bad news is that uh, I'm the last speaker of such a terrific uh, series of of, of talks. Um, the good news for me, at least, is that uh, a lot of people have touched the topics that we're interested in, so explainable AI, uh, federal learning. Um, I want to talk today about the network perspective and what's coming up, hopefully, uh, especially 6G that everyone is talking about. We're still years away from deploying this, but there are already problems that we have identified uh, and solutions that we're trying to come up with. Oh. No, I, I had a lag. Okay, so uh, very briefly, maybe 40 seconds about uh, UCD team. Um, in particular, I'm part of a Nets Lab team, which is a fairly new creation um, by Madusanka, uh, who's leading the team. And then Shan and myself are both, both postdocs uh, that make sure the work is of a good quality. We supervise and lead uh, different work packages in different projects. And then we have um, two uh, PhD students that particularly work on this topic I'm gonna be presenting in. I'm not showing everybody, but in total we have four senior researchers, four postdocs, and uh, 12 PhD students. Uh, there are actually two more starting this month to work on a different project, but uh, this is the team that uh, led to this development I'm, I'm, going to show, I'm, I'm going to be showing you. As for the Lab, we're focusing on three different areas. Lately, on the first one only, which is AI security and privacy, uh, blockchain in 5G, 6G, net, anyway, beyond 5G networks, and then network authorization and security automation. We are part of a numerous uh, EU projects, confidential 6G, that started somewhere around September last year. Robust 6G, uh, which, is, uh, which has only officially started uh, in January of this year. This is a big SNS call uh, project that we're part of. Um, spatial, um, by which this work I'm presenting was funded. And you will see some overlap with some uh, partners like MAN, for example, in my work. Uh, and then there were others like Inspire 6, 5G Plus and 6G Flagship, which was actually the first 6G related um, project led by University of Oulu in Finland. There are four main elements uh, in my talk today. The first one is more introductory to um, AI in 6G. Then uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about attacks on AI and what the UCD team is focusing on. Then some metrics to realize if there is a problem and if there is a problem at what scale it is. And then finally some solutions. Um, to fix those potential um, uh, attack or problems and mitigate the attacks. So uh, as for future networks, uh, I just want to focus on a subtitle here for a couple of seconds. It's an enabler for great improvement, but also an enabler for very complicated attacks. So uh, there are a lot of different <clears throat> ways to present the use um, of AI in 6G networks and maybe even 5G in some cases. Um, I, I picked this one, but what I want to focus on is the left-hand side first. Well, your right-hand side first, and then the left-hand side. So on right, we see a, a number of applications. Uh, this comes anywhere from drones, like UT guys are working on. Uh, there is vehicular to vehicular, or more vehicular to roadside uh, infrastructure communication. Um, so applications that utilize uh, the concepts of 6G and its capabilities like precise location, higher bandwidth, uh, and things like that. Uh, so the applications are you know, never ending. Uh, you go from vehicular to all XR capabilities. We've seen the Apple Glass or Apple Vision, whatever it's called, uh, coming up. This uses a crazy high bandwidth. There's, it's AI driven. There's going to be uh, great advancements and huge problems with this uh, that we probably see now. There are applications for Industry 5.0, um, you know, brain-computer interactions, you name it. Uh, the key point of this is that a lot of these applications are going to be using uh, the AI-driven uh, networks and also we, the solutions based on XAI that guys here want to 
uh, that just presented, and it's one big playground for adversaries. So we expect problems with adversaries, adversaries trying to steal data, um, use models to produce an unwanted um, uh, results. Um, there's going to be attacks at different phases of the training, of the testing, and uh, we have to figure this out. So uh, the AI in 6G is an enabler, it's a defender, but also it could be an offender, a target. So we have to, we have a long way to deploy the 6G networks, but also we need to be very smart about this and some things we foresee, some things we want. Uh, so that's just a landscape that uh, we work in at the moment. As for the attacks on AI, there are many, many different attacks. The, this is not an extensive list. Uh, the reason why the first two evasion attacks that uh, essentially work uh, by modifying input um, and then data poisoning, which are based around injecting malicious data into the training set, are the two that our team is mainly work with, working with. And this is because we work with network classification systems, and those are two very popular attacks on those classification systems. Um, everything from adversarial attacks to model inversion attacks. Uh, you know, Michelle was talking about uh, label flipping. I'm going to be talking about some of this as well. Um, denial of service, backdoor attacks. This is all what's coming up and what is already happening. And um, you know, we'll do our best to simulate these attacks and then come up with some solutions. I just mentioned that we work closely with uh, network activity classification uh, systems. So the idea uh, is fairly simple. You just uh, look at the network data and what users uh, uh, do, um, of course, in a test environment. And um, we figured out, well, not just us, but um, we work with two types of attacks mainly. So this is the poisoning attack, which is happening at the train stage, uh, the training stage of the model training, and then the uh, the testing phase. So to be exact, uh, as for the training phase attack, the attacker is doing, well, he may be doing two things. First of all, he's trying to modify or mutate the original data set. Or secondly, he's trying to add new adversarial data set examples. So uh, I think, again, Man or somebody mentioned uh, generative adversarial networks, which does just that. I will be going through this. So it's the third one here, a GAN-based uh, poisoning attack. And then also we have random label flipping and targeted label poisoning attack. So I think Michelle talked about uh, label flipping. Uh, there are two different types, random, where adversaries are just trying to um, you know, flip uh, the labels of different features. They don't care which one, they just want to mess with the data. And then there's a targeted level one, which where, where they're more specific. And the target here is to change the decision output of the model, but only very slightly, so that you don't, it's, it's hard for you, even harder for you to realize that something was tampered, something, someone played with your model and changed the output. So you don't, when you're an attacker, you don't want to make it very obvious that the decision is different and, and that I am 100% sure that this is a yes or a no. As for uh, the taste phase uh, attack, it's a very similar uh, idea. The attackers are trying to misclassify the model output. Again, they do this um, by misclassifying it very slightly. And usually they try to add some noise that isn't just random noise. Um, so, so once more, the idea here is to skip over this decision uh, boundary very, very slightly so that it, it goes unnoticed. Um, I said that it's, uh, it would be great to have some metrics to scale, to, well, to measure the scale of the problem. Some of those metrics were already presented here. Uh, it's actually one of the big one or two deliverables in the spatial uh, project where different people, different partners work on different metrics. 
uh, in particular, the UCD team, the Montimash team, and a few others worked on uh, the impact and complicity metric. So we have defined, I removed all maths from it, uh, and I just kept the essence of those metrics, by the way. So for poison attacks, we measure impact and complexity, where impact is the original accuracy of benign model compared to compromised models, a very simple metric, but in, in, in the back of it, it, it's not so simple to measure. And then complexity, it's a ratio of poisoned data versus benign data. As for the evasion attacks um, on uh, the impact, the impact is calculated as the attack success rate for a successfully evaded percentage of those um, attackers' samples. And for complexity, we are interested in the CPU usage for used for the generation of this evasion adversarial sam uh, samples. Um, you, you have already seen a, a very similar uh, graph. Um, except that a man, I think you were showing accuracy. So, so this is very similar because we work with Montimash on, on this and we just measure impact. And I think the uh, takeaway from here is that uh, we used three different types of attacks, the new poison data. So this is the GAN generated data, the, general, the uh, generative uh, adversarial networks where you inject data that is very similar to the original data, but it's not that. Um, and this is the graph, this is the line on the bottom. Uh, and then you have the random swapping and targeting poisoning. The reason why um, the GAN one, the one on the bottom, is so far away from the others, even though they have similar impact, is that in this GAN poisoning attack, uh, once more, you very slightly modify this output, so it's very hard to detect. Uh, this seems to be one of the most effective uh, ways of targeting uh, ML models at the moment, at least for what we see. And then uh, for solutions, I have uh, small uh, pictures of guys that were particularly working on this in case you want to ask them very, very specific questions. Um, but um, in the essence, what we do here is uh, we first came up with this poisoning attack detection in FL via SHAP-based uh, feature attribution clustering. A lot of people have mentioned SHAP. Um, I think what I can add to this is that it's also used to figure out which feature contributed to a specific output in percentages. So, you know, if you want to classify if something is a cat and you're looking at uh, four whiskers and claws, you want to see which of these three contributed to the decision that a cat is a cat, right? So was it the whiskers in 40%? Was it the claws or maybe it was a four? Um, so just in the essence why, why SHAP is very useful. Uh, the idea here is that in FL, in federal learning, many clients send local models to a server and what attackers do, they inject poison models which can be identified, which can be identified by the feature attribution differences. And then each model behavior is inspected by SHAP at the aggregation server. So essentially, we don't do anything, um, you know, overly complicated, but before your model gets aggregated with the local server, um, it, it's being evaluated by, by SHAP. Uh, and of course, this can be applied in federal learning, there's also an idea of uh, distributed federal learning, so uh, we look into this as well because it's not going to uh, work exactly as we uh, want. But the, uh, the takeaway lesson here is that when the local server is when the local model is sent to the server, we can differentiate between benign and poisoned uh, model. Um, the way we do this is we use uh, HDB scan which is a tool used by um, people that work with uh, big data, and essentially it clusters uh, data in a way that the, anom the, the anomalies are grouped sort of away from other groups of uh, data. So they cluster differently and they're being shifted from their original distribution. 
And then we can extract this data and figure out which uh, piece of data or which models were, uh, be, be, not piece of data, which models were um, attacked or which models are actually benign. Um, Talita, our second uh, PhD student, had been working for a uh, at the past, I, I would say maybe six to eight months on this particular one, and uh, I, uh, I actually asked uh, ChatGPT yesterday to uh, come up with something that would represent this. And it's kind of like Devil Wears Prada, right? Um, you have a model that is poisoned, but you build a scaffolding around it for it to look like it's a normal model. So. You, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poison model that looks beautiful and looks untouched, but it actually it isn't. So um, you, you will not find many, many references to this attack, but it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting one. And it's an attack that targets XAI by modifying AI ML model to create wrong explanations for post hoc explainers. So those post hoc explainers are actually Sharp and Lime that came up here. So the title of this uh, work, if you look at this on the bottom, it says Falling Lime and Sharp. So everyone is talking about, well, yeah, I'm going to have XAI method. It's a, it's a shop base, so I will explain to you when things go bad. And we do this even if, uh, in our works, but it seems that you can, you can actually fool this. Uh, so why people do this? Uh, many, many different reasons. It could be an unhappy employee that wants to inject the old company with this uh, malicious model, uh, but he doesn't want to be seen. Uh, when multiple services are included to affiliate, to give advantage uh, to one service over the other service. Um, the way we do this is we generate some uh, perturbed da data. We mainly work with uh, Lime-based random perturbation. Then we use different data sets to um, simulate different attacks. The two data sets that we use are NSLKDD and 5G NIDD data sets, and they both actually give us the same results uh, in terms of uh, accuracy. Uh, we then uh, put this into a black box model, uh, different distributions, uh, both the real distribution and then the, um, the malicious one. And then we use a Hellinger distance uh, to obtain the statistical distance. And finally, we um, compare the two. And what that gives us uh, is uh, this. So, on the bottom, we have the control model, so the real model distance. And on the top, we have this malicious adversarial model distance. And essentially, uh, how to read this is, as if you go from left to right, you'll see that the data is being perturbed more and more. So essentially, you inject more malicious data or not real samples into this data, and as you, as you do this, um, <clears throat> the, the distance uh, grows, essentially. Uh, so you know that um, you, know, you work with this uh, malicious form of uh, ML model. Now, on the other hand, for the adversary one, uh, it, actually has, uh, it actually decreases. So it has some uh, negative values at the, at the beginning. And as you inject data, uh, it um, it goes very it, it goes very lightly towards um, uh, towards zero. So and also so that's that's one thing that you can use to figure out if your data if your model is scaffolded or not. The other one is how uh, the adversarial one is very flat. So as you inject more data, uh, the um, the way the curve uh, flattens, or it doesn't, it doesn't even change. So if you look at this from another way, another way around, for the normal model, as, more, as you inject more data, it grows from you know, around 0 0.1 to 0 0.6. So you, you know that with more um, malicious data, you have um, a much greater distance, where this is more flat. And the, way, uh, the reason why that is, is again, for the scaffolding attack, you change this data very slightly 
so uh, it, it works very well at hiding the malicious model. Um, and that should make you think, look, I've injected this model with such a malicious data, but you don't see any differences. So uh, that's just very interesting to see for a 5G and IDD data set, and also the other one, we, they've got the same, exactly the same results. Uh, so that's it from me. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Bart, yeah. for that enlightening presentation. Uh, so do we have any questions for Bart? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so Bart highlighted uh, the dual role of AI in 6G networks, emphasizing the importance of timely attack decision detection and uh, addressing challenges in federated learning. Uh, these observations stress the dynamic and evolving landscape of AI security and emphasize the ongoing need for research efforts and innovative solutions for a secure 6G future. You, Rashid. Yeah. Thank you, Hall, for, the, for coming to this event tonight. Um, it's been an amazing uh, event we've had. Um, but, however, I would like to mention that, as we know, um, this space is nascent and uh, evolving. So, we need to know that this discussion about trustworthy and responsible AI should not just end here in this auditorium. Rather, we should continue the conversation amongst ourselves. So let's network amongst ourselves. Let's meet one another. Let's share experiences. Let's know what each other is doing. As we step out of the auditorium and as we wind down the evening, um, let's walk into the lobby, grab some refreshment and some drink. Let's meet one another. Let's chit chat. Let's talk about what we do. Also, while doing that, we implore you all to please Check the posters and the demo that we have in the lobby waiting for us. We put them together for us. It's just a way to show, showcase what this group that puts this, all of this together, what we are doing at our lab. And also, uh, from me and from my co-moderator, as well as the entire team, everyone who has contributed to putting this together and making it a success, we say thank you very much for your time and do have a wonderful evening. <laughs>